Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here. I guess we've all had uh, three marvelous days at Republika and we're getting towards the finals. So on behalf of Thomas and myself, I wish all of us an interesting and joyful session. Uh, let's get started. What's our starting point? Our starting point is something that may sound familiar to those who saw Florian Schmidt's talk, and we will go down a slightly different alley. The relationship one to all uh, is a pretty powerful thing. You have one agent that could be an individual or an organization, and this agent is capable of reaching everybody else. So, for instance, uh, our agent can, our individual or organization can broadcast a message. Everybody else will receive the message. We will all be on the receiving end. Everybody makes their decision how they want to react to that uh, message. And then uh, that could include getting back to the central agent, uh, ignore it, take any action, whatever. Traditionally, one to all relationships uh, were associated with a lot of power and were thus in the center of political focus. I think of mass media, which are the traditional channels uh, for one all communication. Think of radio, TV, newspaper. It's all about one all communication and traditionally uh, extensive use of mass media was reserved to the powerful elites. Now we all know when the internet came, it came with a promise. And the promise was each and everybody of us will be capable of engaging in one-to-all communication. That's quite a powerful promise because it means everyone online is in principle capable of reaching everybody else online. And by now that means reaching about 80% of the developed world and about one-third of the developing world. And in addition, we know that uh, the backbone of the internet, of the global internet, is cell phone infrastructure. And the cell phone infrastructure is by now completed. Now investment goes into upgrading cell phone in infrastructure so that it can uh, deliver broadband internet. So it will not be very long until, in fact, technically, we are in principle in a situation where every individual on this planet is in a position that they can reach everyone else on this planet. And in fact, even now the internet has delivered on many of these promises. Uh, think of the many marvelous examples that you have seen here uh, at Republika on how individuals or small initiatives manage to mobilize fairly big crowds uh, for political purposes. Or another important area, how many great examples have we seen of entertaining joyful material that because of the internet can now reach big crowds and reach big audiences. So in the realm of social activism, of politics, of entertainment, the one to all communication is actually has become standard. Crowdsourcing also uses the one-to-all communication, but it raises a completely different question because in politics and in entertainment, the bigger your audience, the better. But crowdsourcing is not primarily about politics or entertainment. It's about solving problems. It's about uh, executing tasks. That means now we have economic criteria to fulfill. That means you want to solve your problem with the least possible effort, with using as little resources as possible. Uh, and the same is true for uh, executing tasks. You want to execute them as efficiently as possible. And that raises the question, why would you want to go for a one-to-all communication and talk to everybody? Usually you wouldn't want to do that. You want to do to a few people that actually help you uh, solve the task. And yet there are cases in which it makes sense to address everybody and go for one to all communication. On a footnote, it's often said that uh, crowdsourcing means you outsource a task to a crowd. That's somewhat imprecise. 
it's imprecise because in many cases it's true that the crowd actually solves the task, but there are many other cases in which the crowd is only mobilized as an intermediary step and you want to identify the one or few people to who you actually outsource the task. So to be more specific, uh, our working definition of crowdsourcing is you use broadcast search, you use logically speaking global search to connect to outsourcing partners for problem solving and task execution. Now, initiatives, crowdsourcing initiatives are now in the hundreds and we're in a situation where it's getting difficult to see the forest for the trees. Our claim is that if you carefully look at how does one-to-all communication actually generate value for problem solving and task execution, if you carefully pursue that question, you find out that underlying these hundreds of initiatives are a few basic mechanisms that help us better understand uh, crowdsourcing. And this is what we're after in this talk, reassessing and clarifying the concept. And our guideline for doing this is pursuing the question, how does global search actually create value? Now, the idea that global search creates value has nothing to do with the internet. It's way older. So. Uh, Let's look at two examples that date back uh, millennia. Uh, Chinese legends have it that in the 5th or 6th uh, century after Christ, the emperor wanted to expand his empire and thus needed a big army. So how did he assemble the big army? Which soldiers should he pick? He came up with a very simple solution. He asked every family to contribute one male. Because this task is so humongous, so big, that selection wouldn't be efficient, he went for everyone. So everyone in his community, everyone in his target group, every family was supposed to contribute one male. And it wouldn't matter if the individual contribution was excellent or mediocre, the number, the sheer volume of contributions would actually help him solve the task. Now, for a different, a similarly old, but very different approach, Another story, uh, I'm not sure if you're a particularly religious crowd, this is uh, baby Christ being born. And those of you who know the Bible know that when baby Christ was born, there were these kings or wise men, the three guys, celebrities that came to worship the baby. But they didn't know where to go, so they went to the local king and asked the local king, where should we go? We want to pay... Uh, attention and uh, honor the new king. As you can imagine, the acting king wasn't amused about the idea of a new king being born and decided to get rid of the new king. Yet he had no clue who to get rid of. So what did he do? One to all. So he decided get rid of every newborn. Because, not because he didn't like every newborn. It was just one guy that he was after, a very selective case now, but in order to get to this one, getting to everybody would be an excellent solution. So we have two very different fundamental principles. One is very big tasks, one is very selective tasks, and we go deeper into these two principles now. So, but Really, let's dig into, let's go back to the 21st century. Uh, and yeah, as Robert mentioned, the principles remain the same and we're going to investigate them more in detail, how they play out today. So we distinguish between four types of value and two types are associated with the selective approach. So mobilize many to find the one solution I want. Another one is an aggre aggregated approach. So mobilize many to harness their, all the contribution and exploit the sheer force of numbers. 
I will illustrate those types with some examples. You probably know some or most of the examples, so I will rush through them and just for illustration. So the first one is creative expertise. I'm looking for a new and valuable contribution that requires specific skills. And the knowledge for this is not inside the organization or we don't know where to find it. And the more people we reach, the more the higher the likelihood is that we find a good solution. Most well-known example, we heard it also today, is Innocentive and crowdsourcing contest platform where organizations can ask the crowd to solve an innovation platform. The crowd network submits solutions and the client, the organization on this side, decides who will win. So in this case, Innocentive is an intermediary in the middle who connects the organizations who wants to solve innovation problems with the crowd. Another example from Berlin takes a little bit different approach a more community driven and, and it's a fair approach. They also do this kind of innovation contest, but they separate first the community decides who wins. So there's amount of money a prize for the community decides who is winning and who is not winning. And second, the client needs to pay a second time. So there's, uh, so it's fair in the sense of the client needs to pay two times for the community prize where the community decides. And, um, uh, for the idea um, the client wants to use. Another approach is critical information. Critical for information is the search for context-specific personal experience and knowledge. And in, it's difficult than uh, creative expertise, but for, for critical information, you don't need domain-specific training. It's more about being at the right place at the right moment. And now, that's the only time I go back to history again is the wanted poster is the perfect example for that. I know you're the villain because you're standing next to me and I can identify you and call the police. So that's a classical example of critical information. Another one example are user to user communities like this product communities like Office 365. This is not an advertisement um, where big firms outsource the customer services to get, I have a problem with the product, Robert knows the answer because it is a similar problem with that. Because of his personal experience, he could answer uh, my problem. The third type of value, so maybe a short recap. So the first one was, we need to find someone who has a great idea. The second was critical information. We need to find someone who has the personal experience and knows who the villain is. And now we turn to the other two types where it is really about we want to ask everyone, we want to use, we want to mobilize as many as possible and make use of their numbers. And here we go to the fourth type, uh, a third type uh, for creating value is execution capacity. So this is about the search for a large number of small contributions that add up and solve a big task. And this is a mostly task which cannot yet be solved by computers. Again, well-known examples, most people have filled it out. Recapture, where you, this is the security feature on web pages, you need to type in those numbers, and by typing in those numbers, you help Google to uh, improve uh, the map services. From the public realm, Moon Sioux, Sooniverse, you, the crowd, you help those guys, execution capacity, very small standardized task, help to identify moon craters, you just go there and press on it, that's where there's a crater. And also crowdfunding relies on a similar principle. We search for a large number of users who are willing to donate a small, small amount of money, but overall, if it adds up, it solves a big, um, a big pot of cash. The fourth type is what we call bargaining power. So this is about a search for a large number of similar offerings to lower prices. Because crowd mobilization, if I mobilize many, this creates abundance. And if I have abundance, this can be turned to economic gains for those guys who do the crowdsourcing and the intermediaries. And the examples here, probably also well known, 99design, they have this design contest and the, the logo platform, over, over 40,000 templates because of all the choices. It's easy to, people are willing to deliver for low prices. Another one is Elance, which is technically an online freelance market where you post a job, you get many proposals. Because you get so many proposals, it's all transparent. It's very likely there will always be someone who 
uh, offers a lower price when you po uh, post a job. And of course, those four types do not always occur in the PU form, it's always overlapping. Take Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a marketplace for micro tasks where people go online and, and solve tasks like categorizing home pages. And the execution capacity in this case, of course, we have many small tasks, we mobilize a large number of users, and this is a very efficient, all adds up to solving a big problem. Bar gaining power in a sense is because we mobilized so many users, the people who use Mechanical Turk are able to pay below minimum wage and very low payments because there's so many people, there's always someone else to do the job. Another example where we have combined, of course, is a C click fix, which is something to, fit, uh, to fix potholes and urban maintenance problems. And here's the critical information. Again, I need to be in Toronto on Danda Street to see that there is a pothole put on my, online, my mobile phone, take a picture of the pot pothole, post it on the platform, so Toronto knows, okay, we need to fix this. So this is the critical information part. The execution capacity part on this platform is, by outsourcing the maintenance work to the crowd, we have 24 seven surveillance and quality control of the streets of Toronto because the crowd is everywhere and can everywhere take pictures. It would make no sense for Toronto to do this task itself. So these are the four types which are included in any crowdsourcing uh, platform that create value. But what are really the sources? What are the societal sources that this actually works? And we argue crowdsourcing mainly mobilized from the fringes of a global economy. So the first one, which is actually from a German business book, uh, I like this quote from Christoph Gieser and Lena Schiller Clausen. I'm going to translate it in English. People participate in open source and crowdsourcing activities in the free time to make up for the lack of excitement in the daily job. So one motivation is, of course, uh, that people want to uh, do interesting things. Other motivations are well known, like I want to learn. And especially if I'm in the early stage of career is, Many people do crowdsourcing because they want to signal the skills, they want to build up their reputation, which is essentially very important in an attention economy. Another source of value is what we like to call uh, marginal or the effect of killing time. So you're doing, for example, micro tasks or small rating tasks on the subway. And as Joachim Penkler uh, perfectly noted is, the less investment necessary for individuals to participate because the task is just one click, the higher the likely set of contributors. And the third source uh, is for mobilizing the people is especially in emerging economies. So platforms and many crowdsourcing uh, intermediaries uh, exploit the fact that earning small sums via microtasking or winning a contest just once in a while, just once in a while, even if the winning chances are so slim, is still economically feasible within emerging countries. And an example that reflects that is data from Ross from 2010, where you can see the North American population on uh, Mechanical Turk decreasing at the same time India is increasing, and here we have the turning point 2010. We don't have uh, better data, but we have also other anecdotal evidence that this trend is continuing. For example, here we have design, 99 designs. The design competition model works especially good in Asia, and the design crowd jumps into Asia. They're gonna open up subsidiaries there to mobilize the crowd in Asia and gain more clients. And because we're here at a conference, and where a conference is, it always stands for what the industry, where the industry is heading. And here, the first crowdsourcing global week in Singapore, and also next year in Singapore. So we see the crowdsource, uh, the crowd uh, population overall is shifting towards Asia. So we have another five minutes, I suppose. Uh, where does that leave us? So we have these four types of value that is created through crowdsourcing. And 
Now we could go into much detail and look what are the specific challenges for each of these types. We don't have the time here. We, don't, we did not plan on doing this. Just give you one example. Uh, but before that, note that we have two different types of challenges. One is uh, the mechanics. How does it actually work? And this is pretty much about how does the information flow from one to all and back. So we have to make sure we have an uninterrupted communic uh, communicative chain from one to all and back. Uh, and that's not always easy. So one example, creative expertise, we say it's difficult to communicate the problems and evaluate solutions. Why would that be the case? Clearly, if you have a problem that you cannot solve, and you don't know how to talk to, it's difficult to describe the problem in a way that is both meaningful and doesn't narrow down the problem to where it's unsolvable because it's your limited view of the problem. So, for instance, when NASA tried to, when NASA outsourced or crowdsourced uh, predicting solar activity, a problem that they hadn't been able to solve in years despite a lot of investment, they had to redefined the problem in a way that was different, was broad enough so that everybody could understand it. And in fact, it was a retired uh, telecommunications engineer, not an astrophysicist that actually solved it. The same is true for evaluating the problem. If you're far from your own expertise, it's difficult to evaluate. But the more important part here is the other side. This has to do with the societal challenges. This has to do with shaping social relations. And here are important challenges in crowdsourcing. A few examples. Winner take all competition. Yeah? Uh, Thomas mentioned that your voto now goes into fostering the community because we know from Innocentive that it can be quite frustrating for contributors if you know you have at best lottery-like chances to win because only one will win out of many, many contributions. So there's a potential for frustration there. And in order to make it fair and sustainable, uh, one approach is foster the community. Uh, but there are also interesting implications about communities because think about this. Big data, big brother. Uh, we watch the streets of Toronto, we watch the streets of New York or TripAdvisor. Yeah, we watch all hotels. What enormous amount of control does that make possible? No hotel company would be able to control their employees only close to what all the customers can do. So it's not only about getting more community, getting more crowd, it's also about developing crowd competence, developing codes of conduct, how a strong crowd can actually uh, develop that added value without uh, doing damage. Uh, damage here, the lynch mob, you remember maybe Boston Marathon. Uh, some people thought they saw the perpetrator, posted pictures, somebody was wrongfully accused uh, and they almost destroyed uh, his life. So, there are interesting aspects in here, including all problems, exploitation. We have seen this at the beginning uh, of industrialization, simple tasks, uh, very little, uh, very low wages, exploitation. So we unionized, we developed uh, crowd competence to uh, reshift uh, the income distribution. So it's this part that we think is the future of crowdsourcing. There are challenges here, but they are relatively close to being solved. This is the interesting part, and this has to do with developing more powerful crowds. And more powerful crowds are good because they can resist, but they are also they have a life of their own. So if we go back to assembling an army, we should also keep in mind that this is the army that was assembled by the East Indian Company and the East Indian Company, the Brits, had no idea about the local communities and the rules and the culture. So we're not surprised to hear that it didn't take long until the crowd turned against those who actually had recruited them. So to summarize, 
crowdsourcing is proliferating and multiplying and uh, we're going to see many more variations. So it will be difficult to see the forest for the trees. However, the DNA is simple, it's four mechanisms and I think uh, we were able to explain these basic four mechanisms. Second, where does the value actually come from? It comes from the fringes. Marginalized resources are used through crowdsourcing, are connected to the uh, core of the economy, which has pros and cons. Finally, where is the future? The crowds are getting more political. Uh, Kickstarter is being sued for uh, fraudulent use of crowd funds. Uh, Crowdflower is sued for minimum wage, so there is a lot of movement there, which is important. On the other hand, we know it's not only about making crowds stronger, it's also about developing community competence to avoid big brother phenomena or uh, lynch mobs in the digital age. I think this is where, where we can stop and uh, hopefully we can take a few more questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think that's worth an applause. I fear our time is running up. I think we only have time for one or two questions, but um, was it a question? No. Do, do you see any questions? Oh yeah, there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, then I, I have a question for you. Um, it's it's really interesting that you that you uh, mentioned in the end there could be some kind of an emancipatory potential in the crowd. So the crowd bites back, but. Um, what kind of factors, what kind of variables must be there in order for a crowd to bite back or to become resilient? That's interesting. I think there are two factors. One is uh, crowds are getting more self-confident. They understand how much value they contribute and thus they perceive their own right to ask. The other thing is that I think intermediaries are really important and the most advanced inter intermediaries, and I think uh, Quirky and Yoboto are quite interesting examples, they actually help the crowd to emancipate because they understand if the crowd uh, is stronger, uh, it not only gains more value, it also contributes more value. So there's a win-win situation also in there, uh, as long as the political power and the community competence are both there. That would be my answer. Would you? It's fine. Okay. Okay, I think because of our time, um, thanks again for your presentation. Um, after a short break, we'll continue with our next one. Thank you. Thank you.